Hello, everyone. The webinar will begin in approximately two minutes. Two minutes. Hello, everyone. I think we'll begin. Ask that you remain quiet throughout. We're going to have a Q&A session afterwards. So you can please put any questions that you have, uh, type them in to the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. So this evening's webinar is Reversing Degradation, Agriculture Opportunities Globally Imperative with Blaine Jurdis. And Blaine and I were talking ahead of time about when the first time we met was, and it was actually in 2006 at a grazing conference in Brandon, Manitoba. And I remember the second day uh, I was there, happened to go down for breakfast and sat down next to this guy I, I didn't know. And we started talking and Blaine and I have been good friends ever since. Blaine owns and operates a, a diverse operation near Redverse, Saskatchewan, an operation that today is managed by his son and his family. Blaine has uh, taken a position as a consultant with Understanding Ag, and we've had the pleasure of working with him now for the past six years. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Blaine Jervis. Blaine? Well, thank you very much, Gabe, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't claim to have an awful lot of uh, academic credentials, but I do have a fairly good sense of observation. I have been trained as a holistic manager and I also am a certified educator in holistic management. And so I've done a lot of work in thinking about holes and how things function within the holes. And so that's kind of my field of expertise and understanding these complex ecological systems and when you touch one little spot over here, it'll wiggle in a totally different one. So hopefully tonight I'm going to uh, bring a, a message that is uh, somewhat hopeful. This is my goal here, if I can get my slides to work the way I want. So we should be on a big picture now, is that right, Gabe? I can't see you anymore, so it's, I'm assuming we do. It's okay. correct. Okay, You're, thank you. It's correct, it's good. Blake. Yep. Good, okay. So these are the goals I have for the webinar this evening. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself here and the type of farming that I did. And I wanna be optimistic and positive. You know, I, I talked to a lot of young people who have just graduated from university and they are very, very depressed. They uh, have a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge about climate and so on and they see very little hope for the future of mankind. And I believe there is there is hope. First of all, let me say that I believe climate change or whatever the proper term is, I don't think we really know, is real and, and we are causing it. So I want to say that right up front. But I also believe there's a lot of things that we can do to fix it. So that's kind of why I want to be optimistic and positive. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of climate change. I'm going to look at it in a totally different way than many of you have probably ever looked at it before. And then what can we, each one of us, do to regreen our planet? 
So that's kind of my, my plan here for the next hour or so. So first of all, I live in the province of Saskatchewan, which is in the middle of Canada. It's a fairly big place. There's 1.1 million people live here. We have the capital city here of Regina and the other major city is Saskatoon. Those two cities are roughly a quarter of a million people each. So they compro comprise about half of the population of the province. There's 11 other smaller cities scattered around the province. And then most of the rest of Saskatchewan is extremely rural. In fact, a thousand town person, Ville or town is considered big in Saskatchewan. So you know how rural it is when a thousand is big. So you notice that right around here, all roads, etc., cease. Well, you're now, when you get to here, you're into the wilderness. This top part of Saskatchewan, there's 100,000 lakes. There's no roads, basically isolated uh, native settlements, uh, fishing camps, things like that, mining exploration here and there. So it's uh, the civilization kind of ends there. There's about 60 million cultivated acres in Saskatchewan. We have 51% of the farmland in all of Canada. And there's about 20 million acres that are grazed. My farm is located right down here in the very southeast corner. This is North Dakota. There's the border between North Dakota and Montana to kind of orientate you if you aren't familiar with Canada. So a little over 100 years ago, my grandfather emigrated from Norway and he came to Minnesota first and then he ended up working on a farm near Annetta, North Dakota. And on that particular farm was my grandmother was working as a hired girl and sparks flew and they got married. And then the following May, they were married in December. The following May, they left Annette in North Dakota. My grandfather had amassed a bit of capital by that time. So this is his capital. And he made the trek in that particular outfit from Annette in North Dakota to, to Red versus Saskatchewan. It took them about two and a half months to make that trek. So this is in uh, 1953, a little guy out front there, the cute guy, that was me. My grandfather is standing on top of the separator, the thrashing machine there. And that was the last time that that machine was ever used on our farm. From then on, it was combines. So it's just a little bit of history on our farm there. So my dad and my uncle farmed side by side. The two houses were about three quarters of a mile apart and each of them had three sons. So that's the six of us there as we grew up. We had quite a few adventures. As you can imagine, six boys all about that age. We had various bits of trouble and a few other things. But we used to haul bales with that particular outfit and we, we entertained ourselves a lot. The amount of bales we actually hauled was pretty limited. So eventually I met my beautiful wife, Naomi, and we had three children and through our farming career. And now we have been rewarded with uh, four grandchildren and they are very interesting creatures to have around. It's really neat to be out looking at the land with little kids because they ask the most interesting questions that just get your brain thinking in a way that you never saw it before. So I'd encourage any of you to take young people out with you when you're looking at things and it's just amazing how different they see things. The other nice feature about grandchildren is they go home at night. So that, that's kind of cool. So I'd highly recommend the practice. So as I started my farming career, when I graduated, it was right in the you know, long time ago, over 55 years ago since I graduated, we were right in the heart of the Green Revolution. Norman Burlag's, you know, Green Revolution was just going when we were trying to feed the world. We thought technology, technology, and I bought into that hook, line, and sinker. So for the first 25 years of my farming career, that's what I did. Bought more, more inputs, more inputs, more inputs. And I was kind of a slow learner. It took me a while to figure out that this wasn't working. And what I noticed was that my soil health was going backwards and my bank account was getting slimmer. Those were the two, two factors that caused me to change. So back in, and that, that far back, we didn't have, know much about cover crops, things like that, but it was all unknown yet. So the only thing that I knew about was the farming system developed by Alan Savory in Zimbabwe, where moving cattle across landscapes could, could help to heal the land. So I started seeding grass on my farm, seeding it back to grass. 
Now that in itself was quite a quite a thing. Um, but when you do something not strange in a neighborhood, you definitely uh, get the neighbors talking. Never owned a cow in my life, which was a huge advantage because I didn't have the existing paradigms. So I, I rented some cows or leased cows and we started moving cows across. And over the years, I got actually pretty good at doing this. And we have taken poor quality land or land that we degraded big time between my grandfather, my dad and myself. And we've actually fixed it up pretty good. So I'm just going to share a few things that, that we've done over the years. So this right here is a, it's a very complex hog house. I like to call it my uh, climate controlled biodegradable hog house. So you take about eight or 10 round bales and you put them in kind of a U shape. And then you turn pigs in there for the winter. And so they rearrange them just the way they like. The pigs had already heard me when I took this particular picture. So they were starting to come out. But if I would have taken this picture one minute sooner, you wouldn't have seen a single pig. And so then as the pigs start coming out, you can see what happens. There was quite a few pigs in there. These are the healthiest pigs that you will ever see living in Saskatchewan, Canada. It was probably minus 25 or minus 30 degrees this day. And these pigs are happy and as content as can be. So let's just think about what we're doing here. This is regenerative agriculture at its best. There's absolutely no technology being used. The pigs are providing their own. All I had to do is build a few straw bales around there, which is pretty simple in a farm. When I'm done with that, that, that hog house becomes soil. And the, the meat that is produced from raising pigs like that is absolutely incredible in its taste, its quality compared to pigs that are raised in the barn. Now, granted, I will not get the production in the winter that a hog barn will, but my costs are very low. So this is an example of regenerative agriculture and thinking slightly different. About 15 years ago, my, my son and daughter-in-law, as we started to get into making farming work again, they decided to come back. He, he went to university in Vancouver and spent a few years working out there. And he met his wife in Vancouver. She was city born and bred, never been on a farm before. And they decided they wanted to come out here because they kind of thought there was a future in raising animals the way that we were doing it. And so they started into sheep. They felt sheep were more profitable than cattle were. So currently today, we, he runs a lot of sheep and I still own a few cows. It was a flock of over 300 sheep. So they were just working sheep here in the crown. I can't remember what they were doing. So we raised cows, as I said. Um, so here's just a, an example of cows on the land. And we have to think of cows as the tool. To, to improve land is really what they're doing. We make some money on them too, but really what they're doing is improving the land. So you can see here, you know, they're, they're eating some of the grass on the right-hand side. They just moved off that piece. And you can see how we're putting the litter down. We're tramping the grass. So the cows are eating some, but what's more important to me is we're tramping that litter down onto the surface to help heal the land and rejuvenate, regenerate that land. That's the important part. Here are just a couple more examples of putting that litter down on the surface. So here was a move right back in here. Here's another move right here, another move right here. And you can see the cattle way off there in the distance. But you can see how that land is totally covered. When we can start to see bare land, we know that's not healthy. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we go. So another enterprise that we ran is chickens. And so the, this is what I call a, it's a Salatin style chicken tractor, very high tech again, uh, a little bit of time in a welding shop and a bit of old stucco wire and some roofing panels and you've got one created for virtually nothing. And we move these things ahead every day. And you can see here what happens behind after one day move. This nice, beautiful grass is totally tramped down. Every single square inch of that size of that tractor is covered in chicken manure and then we move it ahead again the next day. And so that again is regenerative agriculture, you know, virtually no technology involved here at all. And the, the quality of those chickens is absolutely incredible. And when we think about it, the purpose of agriculture is to provide high quality food for our bodies. 
When that doesn't happen, society becomes less healthy. And I think that's what we're seeing when we look at our society today, is that we aren't as healthy as we could be. And part of it, I'm not saying it's all farm, but, but part of it is because we don't have the nutrient density in our food that we used to 50 and 60 years ago, because some of the things in the soil are broken. So anyway, that's kind of the operations that, that I have done, just to show you what it does to the land. My wife wasn't too impressed today I did this, but this is one of our, our lawns. Probably shouldn't have a lawn on a farm, but anyway, we did. So here's where the chicken tractors went. This is one year previous. So you can see every single move there where the chicken tractors were. You can see every single move. So just incredible what that, that does to the soil to have that. So that's kind of the farming that, that I have done over the last number of years. Uh, my, uh, my dad, or sorry, my son went, you know, as, as they got a little bit older, we, uh, we uh, moved off the farm about four years ago. We moved up to our local lake. So we're about half an hour from the farm right now. If uh, they want help, we go down and help them. But basically they are, they do the day-to-day -day operations. We still have ownership positions and cattle and stuff, but uh, we are semi-retired from, from, from farming. I, I help out with understanding egg, doing consulting and so on like that. So I want to change gears here now and I want to talk about the history of climate change. So it's not new. We've known about climate change for a long time. In fact, the first scientific paper was written in 1896 by this Swedish scientist. He predicted that CO2 would alter the Earth's temperature. He was concerned about the Industrial Revolution and he figured that out. In 1938, an amateur guy, Guy Collender, he collected climatic records from 147 stations across the world. And his calculation showed that an increase of 0.3 degrees C over the last 50 years. And he felt that was CO2 from the industry. And that study was totally ignored by the scientific community. In 1958, Dr. Charles Keeling, the famous Keeling curve began measuring CO2 levels on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and it started in 1958 at about 320 parts per million. Today, we're well over 420 parts per million. So over those, whatever, how many years it is since 1958, we've went up over 100 parts per million of CO2 in our environment. 67, the first computer modeling was done that predicted that a doubling of CO2 should increase two degrees. In 1985, Antarctic ice cores were done where they looked at the gas bubbles trapped in 800,000 year old ice, analyzed how much CO2 was in there. And lo and behold, they proved that over the last, last 800,000 years, basically the climate of the earth had somewhere between 280 to 300, 310 parts per million over that 800,000 years. More recently, 1880, or 1988, the International Panel on Climate Change was created. And it's really important to understand that it was created to look specifically at anthropogenic emissions, what we put up as people. 1994, the first climate change legislation was ratified by 197 countries. And in 15, the Paris Agreement to limit to less than two degrees was signed by 196. So since 1896 till today, we have basically talked a lot We've done a lot of science, but we haven't really done anything as far as solving the problem. We're still putting CO2 up every day. The legacy load is still in the atmosphere and the oceans. We have this huge issue between economy and environment. Our, envi or our economy is powered on oil, and we are not going to change our lifestyles quickly. It may be desirable to do that. I'm not saying we shouldn't change and get burn less oil, but it will not happen quickly. Not one of us wants to go backwards in our living style. We all live better than the kings and queens of Europe of two and four and 500 years ago. We live, we have a far superior lifestyle to any of the ancient royalty. And not one of us wants to go backwards. So it's going to take a while for alternate technologies to come on stream enough to be able to keep us at the standard of living that we like with, without using oil to do that. I think if we just all of a sudden say we're going backwards to living in a cave with a fire, I think you'll see mass rioting and that won't likely work. So 
it's going to be very difficult to achieve the kind of reductions that we think. Plus, we need to actually suck it out of the atmosphere to solve the problem, just, just to reduce. If, if tomorrow morning I was the dictator of the world and I said, we shall not burn one more ounce of uh, petroleum ever again, the world would continue to warm. It would not stop. It would continue to warm because the legacy load in the atmosphere is still there and the oceans are getting warmer. And as they get warmer, they hold less carbon dioxide. So they're continually leaking carbon dioxide back out. So these are huge, huge problems that we don't often think about. And so when, when young people learn all this, they get very depressed because they see no hope. So let's talk about what actually does drive climate. So there's four things. The first is the natural variability in, in oceans. La Nina, El Nino, we know about those things. There's various other oceanic oscillations that happen. So, so those are all natural. It's not a thing we can do about it. it. will happen. It's going to go warmer, colder. That's just the way it is. There's changes in the Earth-Sun relationship, the solar cycle. Ice ages, those kind of things, thousand year, 5,000 year cycles, you know, they're very slow, but they do happen. The third thing is global warming from greenhouse gas emissions. And this is specifically, again, I'm gonna say this, what IPCC was mandated to look at. Back in 1988, when IPCC was set up, it wasn't yet proven scientifically that GHCs would, would cause climate change. So IPCC was specifically set out to prove that, and it did. There's been over 20,000 scientific papers written since that have proven that. But it's important to remember that. So the number four is the changes, what happens to the water cycle related to how we manage the soil and the land. And that's what I want to focus on. Look at what's happening there. So let's look at it slightly different. So if we look at our blue planet, every single day, 342 watts of energy come from the sun. And every single day, by the various mechanisms that the planet uses, it sends 339 watts back into space. And so this is all controlled by a greenhouse gas called water vapor, not carbon dioxide, water vapor. And that's important to note. That controls 95% of the Earth's heating and cooling. So obviously, if we want to have a stable climate, we should probably get that 339 up to 342. So if we had 342 in, 342 out, we'd be neutral. If we wanted to cool the planet slightly from our past sins, maybe we should go to 344 for, a, for a 10 years or something to cool it back down a little bit. But that's just the straight physics of how it works. This is where our energy comes from. So let's look at some of the cooling that the planet does. How does the planet take those 339 watts back into space? So the first one is a process known as transpiration. And every one of us knows about this. When on a nice warm day, our skins get a little bit wet. And so that water evaporates, we call it sweat or perspiration. It evaporates off, goes up into space, and that causes a cooling effect on our bodies. That's how we keep, it's one of the mechanisms to help keep us cool. The same thing happens in plants. So green, or green leaves and sunshine create photosynthesis, but one of the byproducts then is water. So that water comes out through the stomata as a liquid, and it changes to a gas. So when liquid changes to a gas, there's cooling. This works out to about 85 watts per square meter on a reasonably good green field. Now, that, those, that water vapor goes up into space. When it gets up 3,000, 4,000 meters up above, above the earth, that, that gas will go back to what's called micro drops. It goes back to the liquid form. At that point, there is heat formed. But now we're 4,000 meters up into space, so a good bit of that heat re-radiates back into space. That's how we get the cooling effect of transpiration. So if we increase the green area on our planet by 5%, that would give us our three watts. Now, isn't that a simple solution? That's all we have to do. Now, I'll show you in a minute that we have room to do that. So the other thing that to, to think about in all this process is there's 
things called precipitation nuclei bacteria. And this is relatively new knowledge. So rainfall, well, all of these micro drops that floated up into space, there's, it maybe takes one million of them to make a true raindrop. So something has to make them precipitate. And there's only three things that we know of that do that. There's salt. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I can't, I can't remember the, the second one. And the third one is precipitation nuclei. Th those, uh, those three things are the only things that will make those nuclei come together. And this one is plant-based. And it is by far on land, the largest thing that creates rainfall. So as we begin to re-green the planet, we begin to make the planet more moist, wetter. So that is very, very exciting to see that our precipitation is directly influenced by how green it is. And there's some evidence that, that we're starting to see, especially places in Mexico, one of our consultants down there is actually almost proven that you know the clouds tend to come over his ranch where he's dealing on a big scale and it's, and it's greener. So that's pretty exciting. So the second cooling effect is the albedo effect. And all of us that live in the northern climates know albedo really well. On a nice warm day in March, you'll be out in the yard doing something. You take your jacket off because it's pretty warm. And then you have to move over and do something a little ways away and you happen to be on a snow patch. Well, holy smokes, you're looking for your jacket right away because it's quite a bit colder. So that sun, that 342 watts is coming in. If it hits a white surface, it goes right back up into space. So the tops of white clouds are also pretty good at doing albedo. So that, that's approximately 120 watts per square meter of energy is reflected back into space. So if we increased the cloud cover on our planet by 2%, we're about 50% cloud cover at any one time. So increased by 2%, again, there's our three watts per square meter. So this is just a little, little kind of a diagram, a graph, I guess you could call it. So we have kind of a graph there with the, you know, the, the axis here, and this is supposed to be a plant right here. These are the leaves and these are the roots. So on this quadrant here is representing agriculture. We need to have food and yield to live on this planet. So whether it's cows eat it, whether we eat the plants directly, doesn't really matter, okay? So then, um, we have on this side, what happens to this stuff up here? Does it oxidize? Does it burn off? You know, what happens? Do we till it? Do we over fertilize it? Do we use biocides to stop it or do we overgraze it? These are all possibilities that we can do. And in degenerative agriculture, we've been really good at this. This side down here is called sequester. Take this carbon that's happening up here from photosynthesis, creating sugar, sending those exudates down in here to feed microbes. That's the process. If we make that work well, we're going to take carbon from up here in the sky and put it down in here called sequestration. And it will become long-term stable carbon. And so when we think about this, really our future as mankind on this planet depends on B versus C. If we can get C going better than B, we will re-green that planet. If we don't, we're likely gonna get hotter and the climate will become more extreme. So the benefit center, the dividends are over here on this side. So for every little bit of carbon, every gram of carbon that we put into the soil, we can hold eight grams more water. Now, when we're in a, in a dry situation, where I live, we're relatively dry. We're a semi-arid semi -arid region. So water is absolutely critical to the success of my operation. So if I can make take my soil and take it from 2% to 6% or 8% organic matter by doing C instead of B, man, I'm going to be way ahead of the game. Also, as I've talked about showing you chickens and pigs, is that our food becomes healthier when we start having C happen. We become more resilient. We're able to withstand, you know, long wet spells, long hot dry spells. We become way more resilient. Plants go down better. They, there's more space in the soil. So those roots can go down in there. 
And lo and behold, as a farmer, I become more productive. So it's kind of an important thing to be thinking about. So what regenerative agriculture is then is maximizing that sea of putting carbon in and minim minimizing how much we send back up. So clouds and transpiration, those two cooling factors only work if that soil is ready to grow plants. If that soil is compacted and degraded and we can't do anything to fix that, all of the cooling that I just talked about from transpiration and, and uh, albedo will not happen. So we need to be aware of that. So we have to use these regenerative principles here to make that soil start to function again the way it's supposed to function. So the principles then of regenerative agriculture are number one, or we don't order them, they're all equally important. Keep a living root as long as possible. So we want to keep plants green from snow to snow. You know, in my part of the world here, the, the, the main crop is wheat, wheat or canola, which is only green for about 70 days of the year. We have the potential to capture solar energy here in my cold part of the world for 260 days. So if I'm not sending exudates down, sugar down from those green leaves for 190 days, what happens to all those microbes I desperately need to make that sequestering happen, that C, if I want to maximize the C, how do I do it? No, I can't do it. So we need to figure out ways of farming that we can keep it green longer. Nothing wrong with going wheat or canola, but what, would, what can we do before or what can we do after or what can we do during to keep it green as long as possible? So the second one then is armor on the surface. And I showed you a picture of that with the litter down with the cow grazing. And that is absolutely critical. Think about this skin right here. If I stuck this hand into a fire and burnt it, you know, likely the doctor would come along with a sad long face in a day or two and say, sorry, Blaine, we got to cut your, your hand off because it can't survive. This stuff is critical to my success as a being. It keeps pathogens out. It keeps moisture in. It keeps me warm, cool, depending on the temperature. It does all sorts of functions that are absolutely critical for my success. And the same thing is true of armor on the soil. If we don't have our soil covered in litter, things start to go downhill rapidly. Diversity. You know, when my grandfather came here a hundred and some odd years ago, the prairie was extremely diverse. It was probably 250, 300 species of plants on every acre. He went with the plow and in one stroke, he simplified that and began to grow wheat. One crop, monoculture. And it's been that way forever since. There is huge consequences to the life in the soil when things like that happen. So we have to think up ways to get more diversity into our system. So disturbance is another one that if, we, if we're doing a lot of disturbance and that can be things like tillage is disturbance, uh, overgrazing is disturbance, uh, high rates of nitrogen fertilizer could be disturbance, uh, repeated use of uh, high rates of you know, fungicides or uh, glyphosate, some of those type of chemicals can be very negative to, to soil health and can be disturbance. So those are all things that we need to think about. And once again, I'm not saying don't use them, but think about what they do and how to minimize the negative consequences if you do have to use them. You know, many farmers, they just, it's just a practice. They just do it, do it, do it, do it. You know, and they don't think it through. What is it that I can do to change that, to make it better? And the last principle then is to incorporate animals. And I talked about that when I was sharing some of my own farm, that animals, our lands uh, grew up or the soil was formed with animals operating on it. And so if we think that we can totally regenerate soils without animals, we can maybe get part way there, but it's sort of, sort of like tying one hand behind your back. It's gonna be very difficult to do that unless we have animals. And then the last one is, is the context. So these first five principles here are all natural principles. This isn't something some guy made up or anything like that. This is natural principles that you observe in nature. The last one is man-made, the context, and that's things like, you know, how much money do you have? What, you know, what financial position are you in? You know, is your dad on board? It's a son and father operation. 
you know, is the dad all gung or the son all gung ho and the dad says, no bloody way, sonny, you aren't doing that in my farm. You know, those are all part of the context. We need to work that through if we're going to become more regenerative. You know, uh, what type of soil do you have? Where's your farm located? Are you in uh, Missouri or are you in Northern Saskatchewan? That makes a big difference what you can do on that particular farm. So every farm is unique. Every farm will have a different context and it's really critical to understand your context before you begin to implement these principles. The principles are the same around the world. The practices will be extremely diverse. So this is a, a learning I had from holistic management many years ago. So various parts of the world, the dominant vegetation was forests. You know, you think about Europe, you think about Eastern North America, the tropical rainforests of the world, those kind of places. And what, what made them, what made the forest become dominant was the fact that it had relatively reliable humidity and rainfall. It may not have been terribly wet, but it was reliable and the humidity was high. So we call them less brittle areas. And the forest tended to be the ones that, that did that. That's where the, the, that was the type of, of climate that they liked. So forests tended to be the ones that uh, came. So every fall, we have leaves. So those forests drop all those leaves down on the surface of the land. And so they laid there in a mat. And the forest was able to create the conditions of warm, wet, and dark. So we need that particular condition met in order to make rot happen so that that can cycle. We need to have birth, growth, death, and decay happening. If it didn't, obviously there would have been 50 or 100 years of leaves in a forest. There would have been 20 meters of, of dead leaves. Well, obviously the forest wouldn't survive. So there has to be mechanisms in nature to make things recycle. So in a forest, it could do that all on its own. Just simple, just by the fact that the humidity was relatively regular, the rainfall was re relatively regular. And so the conditions of warm, wet and dark could be achieved on the, the, the forest surface, on the floor of the forest, that could happen. So now we're gonna go out to where it's more brittle. And the dominant species in the drier areas of the world was grass, and I'm gonna use grass as a generic term. It was very complex, as I've already said, several hundred different species of plants, but the dominant species were grass. There's something like 6,000 grass genera of grasses in the world. Not one of them drops its leaves. This picture on the left is grass after a winter in Saskatchewan where we have significant snow. And you can see how erect that grass is. So how would that recycle? We can't achieve warm, wet, and dark because it's not on the surface of the land. And even if we got it down to the surface of the land, because it's much drier, we cannot reliably predict that warm, wet, and dark will occur to get decay. So that causes a bit of a problem. So if we just forget about the right side of the picture and just focus on the left for a minute, so next year, so that's how it looks. So this is the next spring. So if we dug down in there, we'd find there's new green shoots coming up. But guess what happens to those new green shoots? They're, in, they're encountering no photosynthesis because it's shaded. Those grass plants weren't meant to evolve like that. So they have a tough time to struggle through, but they probably will. And then next year, we're going to have two years of litter built up. The next year we come along, that poor grass is gonna have even a harder time, but it probably won't make it again. So now we have three years later built up. Maybe by year four, it says, sorry guys, I don't like this anymore and it dies. So then we get a bare spot and this is the cancer called desertification. This is how it works. Or the other alternative that mankind is really good at is we throw a match in there and burn it off, burn all of that carbon and put it up in the atmosphere. We go back to that B. Instead of putting it as a C and making it recycle, we put it back to a B and make it go up. So how did nature work this out? Well, mother nature is pretty clever. It has elegant solutions for problems like this. And there is no grazing area in the world where there wasn't ruminant animals. So the warm, wet and dark 
was achieved inside the rumen of the animal. So that's important to understand. So if you want to have healthy grasslands that are putting carbon into the soil, you need to have animals that are moving across that landscape. Doesn't matter what kind of an animal it is, it can be a giraffe, it can be an elephant, it can be a zebra, it can be a cow or a bison, it does not matter, a sheep. It's irrelevant. It just, they need to be managed in such a way that they're moving across the landscape. And so you can see on the right hand side there where the cattle are grazing, how they're tramping that down, getting that land covered in litter and allowing the light to get down to the surface. They'll only be there for a day and those plants will then have a chance to express. So if we go back to our forest situation, if we wiped out, suppose that mankind disappeared and we could come back in 500 years, the forest would totally look the same as they did before Columbus landed in North America. They would totally restore themselves. The great grasslands of Western North America would not look the same unless somehow there was enough grazing animals survived our extinction that they could begin to do as the bison of old move across that landscape. We would become a desert is what would happen. So that's really important to understand the difference between the two ecosystems, the wetter one versus the drier one and how mother nature made that work. So if we look at what we've done in agriculture over the last few years, about 10,000 years ago, we decided that it would be more fun to grow food rather than chase it. So agriculture began in, in you know, various places in the world, but in the Fertile Crescent was one of the main ones. At that time, there was about 8 billion hectares of forest and about 5 billion hectares of rangeland. So 13, 13 odd billion hectares of functioning ecosystem on our, on our planet. So 10,000 years later, you've taken that forest from eight down to three and a half. And of that three and a half, about half has been cut the second time or the first time it's, it's regrowth. The, the rangeland hasn't changed that much. We've lost about a billion hectares of that. We've created a new category called cropland, about one and a half billion hectares of cropland where we grow wheat and canola and corn and soybeans and those kind of crops. And then we've also created one more new category called desert. Four billion hectares of desert has been created by agriculture, deforestation, various things that we have done in the last 10,000 years. So you just think about that. We've got 13 billion hectares of functioning ecosystem and we've now desertified 4 billion of it. That's one quarter. We have lost, it's been estimated that we have lost 50% of the photosynthetic capacity of the earth by this. So you just think about the cooling effect I talked about transpiration and albedo. You know, that is a big factor in climate change right there. We just have to think about things a little bit different. Let's get our context right and ask the right questions. You know, I'm not saying CO2 isn't important. It is, but there's a lot more things in, in affecting climate than just CO2. When we just focus down on one little thing, we don't see that whole. We have to look at the whole if we're gonna be successful in solving this problem. Just a picture from looking at, you can see the desertification there. You know, when I was a young man going through school, I was taught the Sahara Desert was the largest desert in the world, but I wasn't taught that it was man-made. You know, it's, it's, so th these are all things. This is the, the fertile crescent rate in this part of the world here where our ancestors learned how to farm. Well, holy smokes, it's not very fertile today. If you've ever had a, you know, Syria feud in, in I think it was 09, 06, I think, Syria, you know, they had a million farmers move off of the land into the cities, which created a civil war. But the reason they moved off is because of desertification. They couldn't grow anything anymore. And that caused the Syrian civil war. So this is a real problem that happens every day. And it's estimated by the United Nations that we have lost one third of the farmland in the last 40 years due to this process. So do we have room to regreen? You better believe we got room to regreen. We got lots of room. So here we have a desert and deserts tend to do what's called capping. You can see they get that hard surface 
very, it's almost, you can't hardly break it with your fingers. Sometimes it gets very, very hard. It's just one of the natural processes that soil tries to protect itself as best it can. So that is a very difficult condition to fix unless we use ruminant animals. So, you know, there isn't a lot for them to eat out here, but we can do various things to herd them across, whatever. And you can see here is a cow put a foot right there. You can see the depression. So if there is a tiny bit of moisture, guess what will happen right there? There'll be water stand there and we might get germination. Here's another one. You can see the new grass beginning. And then if we manage this land properly, so we don't chase every animal in the country to that tiny little spot of green grass, so it has a chance to express itself, begin to grow, over time, we be can begin to re-green. So it's pretty exciting stuff. So here we have a picture of, you can see the fence there. On the left-hand side, environmentalists determined that cattle were evil and they were causing desertification. So they removed all grazing animals 30 or 40 years ago. No animals in there to graze. On the right-hand side, this particular rancher was doing a pretty nice job of grazing. You can see that looks pretty healthy. You know, it's dry, obviously, because the grass is brown, but you don't see bare land. You see lots of diversity. Looks pretty good. So one other factor that I didn't mention when I talked about the actual, how, the, the, how that heat moves around on the planet. Guess what happens to that bare spot over there on the left-hand side? That gets pretty hot on a hot day. We've all experienced putting our bare foot on bare land and you go, ouch, you know, it gets really warm. And guess what happens to that heat at night? It re-radiates back up. So those heat that moves back up, but guess what it hits? It hits that layer of micro drops. It can't get through that. So the heat is trapped. That becomes what we call a heat dome. So the natural process was that, that those micro drops, the precipitation nuclei went up, coalesced them, rain fell, the atmosphere cleared, heat could go back out into space. Pretty simple, but we've broken that by the way we've managed our land. So this is a, something that's absolutely critical to understanding climate change. We have to really be thinking about these types of things if we want to be successful in our battle. So, you know, we, we hear about methane all the time and cows and how evil they are. And, you know, cows emit methane, so therefore I'm going to become a vegan. Okay, that's... That's one possible solution. However, healthy range sequesters more carbon and encourages, you just saw in that picture, way more biodiversity. So when we factor that in, is that methane that bad? Most of the land that produces our food is too dry, too rocky, or too, topog too topographically challenged for cropping. So that 4 billion hectares of rangeland, we, we cannot farm that. So if we want to re-green that, we need to have ruminant animals walking across that, moving across that landscape constantly, making that land healthier. That's the only way we can re-green it. The other thing that nobody has ever mentioned is, is there's bacteria on healthy land called methanotropes. Methanotropes directly consume methane. I have never yet seen a scientific paper that talks about that. So, you know, sometimes I think maybe methane is a, a wee bit of a red herring. It's, uh, you know, I think we need to get things into context. And again, let's not just talk about methane. Let's look at the whole. There's been ruminant animals on grasslands for many, many thousands of years. And we've never had issues with methane on the planet. So maybe it's not the ruminant animals that are the problem. We need to think about that a little bit. So here we have the soil on my farm on the right-hand side. That's what my grandfather came to 110 years ago. It was actually, it was 12% organic matter. And you can see it's nice and black. It kind of looks like chocolate cake when you look into that. That's what we call aggregation, very porous. There's lots of space and you can see there's 60% space in that soil, nothing, it's just space. That's awesome when you can get soil like that. That's what we wanna see. That allows roots to go in, it allows water to go in, it allows 
air to get down in there, all these things that are critical to make that soil function, to maximize that seed, sequestering that carbon. The black color is carbon. So over the, the hundred odd years that my ancestors and myself farmed that farm, we managed to work it to what was on the right. We managed to farm the carbon out, the soil organic matter by tillage, by overgrazing, by monoculture, by those various things that we did on our farm. We managed to take the farm or the soil on the right hand side and get it to look like the soil on the left hand side. And you can see the consequences of that. You know, there's only, I think we were as low as 2% in the odd spot but there's only 25% space. When you look into that soil, it looks really compact. It's very, very difficult for roots to grow. They can't get in there. Oxygen, air can't get down in there. Water can't get in. So the water runs off if we do get a rain. So it's very, very negative. So moving from the right to the left is what I call degenerative agriculture. And for 10,000 years, that's all we've known. That's how we got 4 billion hectares of desert is that every farmer in the world farmed like this. And it's not like we've set out, my grandfather didn't come here to de deliberately destroy land. That wasn't his intention at all. He did the best he could, just as my dad did. Just as I tried to do too, but I didn't have enough knowledge or wasn't enough knowledge yet. Now we're to the point where we're finally getting, we're just at the beginning. We got a long ways to go yet, but we're starting to learn how to regenerate land. We can take it from the left-hand side and we can get it back to the right hand side. And as we do that, we begin all these other processes of transpiration and albedo, and these things start to happen and we begin to cool our planet. But we've got to be able to make that soil function for any of that stuff to happen. So a guy by the name of Walter Yenning, he's a soil, soil microbiologist in Australia. He's the guy that, that's done a lot of this research on the cooling, the transpiration, 85 watts and the albedo with the, the 100 odd watts of cooling. And he, he uses the, the term soil carbon sponge. And he, he uses this really simple analogy. He says carbon is like putting bed springs in your soil. The more carbon you put in, the further apart you push those soil particles. So we got more space in there. You know, we got space, things are happening. A lot of the farms that I work with here in Western Canada, one of the very first diagnostic tools that I will use when I go onto a farm is a shovel. And I can tell an awful lot by how easy that shovel goes in. And on most farms, it does not go in very easy. It is so compacted and hard. It is absolutely unbelievable. I've seen plant roots go down about this far, and then they make a right, a 90 degree corner and they just follow that compaction layer. So the farmer just spent a fortune to buy some land and he's only farming this much of that farm because his soil is so compacted. So we got to get this soil carbon sponge functioning. If that starts to happen, then some of the cooling effects can go. We got to get regenerative agriculture happening. So just to go on about cows again for a minute, it's not the cow, it's the how. In both cases, these cows, it, it's the management of the people, not the cow that's doing it. On the left-hand side, I can't defend that production system, but I sure in the heck can defend the one on the right where those cows are moving across the landscape, consuming that grass and regenerating soil as they do it. On the left-hand side, it's a degenerative model in my opinion. So one of the other things that I mentioned one of the principles was to keep it green longer. And this is absolutely critical to success as well. If we're only growing wheat for 70 days, that's not very long to have the cooling effect from that wheat. The other 190 days, nothing is happening. So that that's becomes negative to climate change. So this picture was taken December the 19th on my farm in Saskatchewan. And you can see how green that grass looks yet on December the 19th. So if you actually went out there on a sunny afternoon and sat down in there, hopefully there would be no wind, but find a spot out of the wind and actually start to measure, you would find that probably from between two and three in the afternoon, there actually could be a tiny bit of photosynthesis happening, sending sugar down to those microbes. And what we're learning is the soil gets healthier and we get, keep a litter layer, keep that soil armored, it doesn't freeze. And so there's 
evidence now, there's research been done, that proves that microbes actually stay alive right through the winter. And there's actually photosynthesis will happen through snow. So this goes on a lot longer than we think. So we need to have green plants as long as we possibly can in the spring, right from snow, when the snow disappears, right through till the snow comes, if we want to have this cooling effect happen. Absolutely critical. So here again, I'm just going to re-emphasize these principles of regeneration. You got to keep that living root as long as possible, which I just talked about, keeping it green, keeping sunshine being captured, creating sugar, sending it down to feed the microbes. Because ultimately it's the living and the dying of those microbes is what creates the organic matter, the carbon sequesters that carbon down into the soil. Keeping armor on the surface, you got to keep it cool in the summer, warmer in the winter. I just talked about that. The soil will not freeze hardly at all if you have a decent armor layer on top, even in my cold country. Keeping diversity is important. More jobs get done when you have diversity. You have all monoculture, it's every plant needs the same thing at the same moment. Nature never was designed to function that way. Minimize our disturbance, keep the tillage down. You know, if you have to till, fine, go ahead and till. But think about why you're doing it. You know, think about your high, high rates of nitrogen. You really need to be doing that. And incorporate animals if you possibly can. So when I started doing this, it's, uh, I guess it's 25 years now, I've been, been farming regeneratively. And as Gabe said, we met way back, and I think it was, we figured out 2006, well, I started a little bit before that. But at that point, it was very, very lonely. There was nobody you could talk to to see how crazy were you or were you actually making sense. You know, you were out there all alone. There was no support network. There was nothing there. You know, we slowly found each other. Some of the, the thinkers, I guess, in regeneration, we, you know, we eventually found each other and you'd learn about this guy, you'd give him a call. And, oh, yeah. You know, and you, we started to get networks, but it was slow. So one of the things that, you know, I was always asking myself, is this working? You know, my hunch was it was, but I never was totally sure. So I had a guy by the name of Peter Donovan from the Soil Carbon Coalition. You can look him up and under that too. I asked him to help me figure this one out. And so he's pretty good with computers. And so this is a, a map of normal digitized vegetation index for, for 12 years of data here. And so what it's measuring is how green my farm was versus my neighbor. So he just took a, he took my township or my section of land, my home section of land. He put a, put a red bar or blue bar around it. And then he went three miles out on all sides. So a township. And he put a red bar around that and then he, the computer started to calculate out how much sunshine was captured on my piece of land versus the neighbors. And so you can see here in those 12 years of data that every single year I captured more sunshine than the neighbors did. That gave me a lot of confidence to know that, hey, I was on the right track. Things were going correct. Because when you can capture sunshine, that means that all these other things I've been talking about, transpiration, and cooling, and that stuff, putting carbon in the soil, that is actually happening. So I'm getting close to the end here now. So I'm going to just share a couple of examples of some of the people that I work with up here in Western Canada, how they have used cattle and grain to, to make both enterprises work way better. So these are what are called chaff fingers. So it's a very simple machine. Most farmers can figure out how to build it in their shop in a day or two in a rainy day. It's basically a set of fingers that are mounted on the axle and a counterbalance. So when that gets to say 400 pounds, it goes down on the ground, the chaff pulls off from the stubble and then it springs back up and you just keep going across your field. So this, this particular producer here, they, this was a field of oats that they harvested for grain. The purpose of the crop was to grow oats. So they were happy with the yield. When they seed their oats in the spring, they put a biannual crop called rye in there with the oats. And you can see the green of the rye in there. So rye is designed to be seeded in the fall and then it goes through the winter and expresses itself the next year and can be combined the following July or August. 
So they're kind of using it in a different purpose. They're seeding it in the spring. And so it kind of gets tricked and it stays vegetative. So here they have all of these nice chaff piles. And so they'll limit fence this field a little bit. So the cattle can't go over at all in the winter. And then once the snow comes, they turn the cattle out there. The cattle absolutely love those green leaves. So they eat them. Plus they got all of that chaff to go through, which is fairly high energy feed. So basically the waste product from, from the combine, from the oats is now going to feed cattle. That is regenerative. That becomes very, very profitable when you do that. And they probably use a few alfalfa bales every week or something. They take a few out to bring the protein content up, content up because this will be lacking somewhat in protein. So they unroll a couple bales for the cows. But basically that's will keep them going from say, you know, mid-November until mid-February till the snow gets too deep. You know, virtually a free source of cow feed. So that becomes very profitable. Just another producer, a different area doing exactly the same thing. This guy wasn't putting rye with his, but same idea. You can see the cows going through those chaff piles late in the fall. So here's another example. This is corn and hairy vetch. So these guys are planting corn and hairy vetch in the spring, basically at the same time. This corn is being harvested for grain. Uh, it's quite a good crop of corn for our part of the world compared to Iowa. I'm sure it's not very good, but uh, you know, when we get 110 bushels an acre up here, we think that's a pretty good corn crop. So this hairy vetch cost about $20 an acre. So it was put in there in the spring, as I said, it gets a shot of Roundup once, which makes it kind of sick. So it stays down a little bit. And then it starts to grow once that corn gets up there, you know, in that V8 or V10, somewhere in that stage, it starts to go pretty good. So we measured how much hairy vetch was in this particular field. And we got nine tons of biomass. So that's pretty impressive. So think about the regenerative principles. We went away from the monoculture corn crop into two crops. One of them is a legume. So there's gonna be some nitrogen there for the next year. We've got a little bit of diversity. Uh, it's green or longer. You know, here we are out in November and it's still green. And we're now gonna incorporate animals. So this is the exciting part. So here we incorporated animals. So this guy, he put the cows in there once the combining was done and the, co the cows did well on the corn stover and the hairy vetch. And it ended up that he got 180 animal days an acre. So that means each acre fed 180 cows for one day. Wow, on waste product from a $20 investment in hairy vetch. So conservative number up here is $3 for winter feeding. So that's $540 an acre more he, ma he made on this field by adding that hairy vetch and the animals once the, the growing season was done versus if he would have just had monoculture corn. And it cost them $20 worth of hairy veg seed to do that for $540. So people say regenerative agriculture, you can't be profitable. I say BS. Regenerative agriculture is very profitable when you start to use this thing up here and think about what to do. When you can start using the waste product from one enterprise to, to feed the next one, that really works well. So, as I said at the beginning, I don't believe that we on planet Earth can solve this problem by limiting CO2. I just don't think that's feasible. So we have to look at it different. We need to look at it more holistically, look at what actually drives the, the heating and the cooling on this planet. And that particular gas is called water vapor, not CO2. Water vapor controls 95% of the heating and cooling on this planet. As I showed you, we got lots of space to keep it green. There's all kinds of space. Every single farm field that I see in my part of the world could be greener. Livestock are absolutely critical to ecosystem function in grasslands. If we want to be growing grasslands on those 4 billion hectares of, of drier, more brittle landscapes, we better be having animals on that land or else it will desertify almost immediately. So it's absolutely critical to have livestock operating on grasslands. And, you know, we hear all kinds of calls that we should get rid of all cattle. You know, that'll save our planet. We need to counter that with some intelligence. 
because those people do not understand how ecosystems function. So regenerative agriculture, I believe, will easily solve our three watt problem. We just need to get doing it. So what can you do as an individual? You know, we all throw up our hands and say, oh, I can't do anything. I may as well he's just eat, meat, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, that's the way it is. But I think there's a lot of things that we can do. So I think the first thing is when we put that fork to our mouth, every one of us does it two or three times a day, ask yourself, how was that food produced? Was it produced regeneratively or was it produced industrially? How was it produced? What was it doing? What was the ultimate effect on the environment? And I'm going to use, I'm going to use grass raised beef and an impossible burger is, is my example here. So the synthetic meat is genetically modified soybeans. So grown in monoculture, synthetically fertilized with using nitrogen fertilizer and phosphate, which are very high petroleum consumers. It likely had herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides to keep it growing and healthy. So those are all of the things that happen to that. Land, land uh, soil health was likely going backwards. If you walk into that soybean field, it would likely be sterile. You wouldn't hear a sound. You wouldn't hear insects trilling. It would be virtually dead quiet. You probably wouldn't even see birds flying around it. So that's how the impossible burger is created. They break that apart at another 40 or 50 different pieces of plants from other things and create this burger. Now we contrast that with a grass fattened burger that was raised on, on a diverse pasture mixed with movement. You know, there's probably a hundred species, maybe 200 species of grass. It will be alive with noise, insects talking. There will be birds flitting. There will be birds flying overhead. You'll see swallows following the cows. You'll see cowbirds following the cow. Herd. It's alive out there. It's in tremendous, it's building, it's putting carbon into the soil. The, the former is putting carbon, it's a bee, it's putting carbon up. This one is putting carbon down. And so I think it's really important that when we think about eating, we have to remember that it doesn't matter what you eat, whether it's plant, animal, whatever you want, there is death caused. In order for there to be life, there has to be death. And so whether we eat a plant and feel really good about it because we aren't killing, you're really fooling yourself because you weren't killing. You're killing that carrot, or if you're eating wheat, you know, flour or something like that, you're eating that tiny embryo that could be a potential wheat plant next year. So whether you're eating a cow or you're eating a wheat plant or whether you're eating lettuce or whatever, we all cause death with every single bite. So it's really important, I believe, to ask yourself, and it's not my business to tell anyone how to eat. You know, if you want to be vegan or vegetarian or carnivore, go for it. Do whatever you like. But I think it's up to each one of us as individuals to figure out how that food was produced. So if you live in a city or a farm, plant more trees, plant a garden, grow some of your own food. Instead of having a great big lawn, why the heck don't you get some garden growing? Plant some food. I can be the best regenerative farmer in the world, but if you guys don't support me, I'm not going to be in business very long. I'm going to be broke out of business. So you need to, as urban consumers, you need to support us or else we can't do that kind of job of healing the landscape. We're less than 2% of the population in North America's farmers. You know, a hundred years ago, we were 90, 90 odd percent of us were farmers, but we're now three generations away from that. And most people don't have a good understanding of ecosystems anymore. So we need Every one of us needs to show the good news of regeneration and support regeneration in any way that you possibly can. You have to be busy telling our neighbors in the city, telling our politicians, whether it's our MLAs or our senators or uh, whatever, whatever government we live under, you know, we need to be influencing them. That's our job in a democratic society is to be influencing our governments because some of the decisions they're making are not very, very intelligent ecologically. And so we need to be encouraging our local and national governments that green is important. 
absolutely critical to, to be able to cool this planet off. So I'm gonna close with this particular quote right here. So we, we've lost an awful lot of uh, civilizations. I think it's 26 civilizations have disappeared due to the collapse of agriculture. How arrogant would we be to presume that the root cause of our collapse won't be exactly the same thing? And so if we don't get regenerating, I believe that we're headed down this very same road as 26 civilizations before us. So I'm reasonably optimistic that we're quite intelligent people and that we can do this. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And I believe now you're going to have the opportunity to ask me questions. Thank you, Blaine. That was excellent. Uh, the slide up there now, just a reminder, if you're interested in learning more about regenerative agriculture, we do have our online courses, Regen Ag 101, and our adaptive grazing course. We also encourage you, certainly, if you have the opportunity to attend the Soil Health Academy. And then uh, put a plug in there for Regenified. The Regenified program, you're going to be hearing a lot more about in the future. As a matter of fact, we're going to have Salar Shimarani, the CEO of Regenified, and Doug Peterson, Chief Scientific Officer of Regenified, on an upcoming webinar soon. So with that, we'll, we'll dive right into some questions that were asked here. I'll read them, and then Blaine, you can tackle them if you'd like. First one comes from Teresa. What accountability are corporations taking uh, regarding packaging plastic, single use, non compostable, et cetera? And bulk buy versus packaged good? That, that's a pretty big question there. You want to take a stab at that blank? Oh, not really. It's not my area of expertise. I agree totally with the where the questioner is coming from, but. Uh... I have no, no uh, jurisdiction in those areas, so I'll just uh, leave yeah, it at that. Yeah, I, I think Blaine know what it comes down to is what you talked about yeah. at, at your closing. It takes yeah. all of us and yeah. everybody needs to look in the yeah. mirror and decide to do what they can to help. It's easy to pass the buck, you know, but why not do what you can? And certainly agree, Teresa, that large companies need to do more, need to set the example. Stu asks, when you are testing soil, do you look at the amount of nitrogen in the soil? In other words, carbon to nitrogen ratios. Yeah, well, we, we uh, look at that. We look at, uh, we use a test called the Haney test, which uh, is, a, is a more natural type of soil test, which kind of equates to what the roots will actually see. And also we usually do a, what, a phospholipid fatty acid profile test, which, uh, Talk, shows us what the ratio is between the bacteria and the fungal component of the soil. And those are kind of critical to determining, you know, what type of crops we should be growing and, uh, you know, how degraded the soil is, all those kind of things. So those, those are a couple of the tests that we, that we use when we first go on to a new farm. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit to that. We have to realize that, that all soils approximately, uh, one part nitrogen to 11 parts of carbon. And one of the things we see occurring over and over again, especially on cropland, high production cropland, is the overuse of synthetic nitrogen. And that biology in the soil will readily consume that nitrogen. But once it does, it's gonna go looking for carbon because it's gotta balance it all, its own needs and most bacteria are approximately five parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So they need a lot of carbon. Well, they will consume any carbon in the soil in the form of, you know, decaying plant residues. They'll consume uh, the residue on the soil surface, but sooner or later, they're gonna start consuming the carbon that holds soil aggregates together and you'll actually collapse the structure of your soil by applying 
too much synthetic nitrogen. And we see that over and over as we consult on these cropland farms. We need to keep in mind too that above every surface of acre of earth, there's approximately 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. I still can't comprehend why people insist on writing checks rather than harvesting some of that out of the atmosphere. Sometimes when I uh, get in front of a group, I'll ask what the major fertilizer elements are. And of course, every farmer will say NPK, but that is not accurate. It's C, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All are free. Plus, as Gabe just said, the nitrogen is free if we make the soil healthy and get the microbes doing what they're supposed to. So all of those elements are absolutely free. And when we do some of our uh, total nutrient digestion testing, here in Western Canada anyway, there isn't a soil that we have found yet that is deficient in one single nutrient from phosphorus to zinc to boron to you name them. Everyone that we know of that's essential for plant life is in more than adequate levels in our soils here. But every single one is deficient in microbes to make it available. So what we need to do is farm, get farming in such a way to make those microbes start to work. Yeah. Uh... Just Google sometime trees from thin air. Approximately 97% of what a plant needs for growth actually comes out of the air, not out of the soil. There seems to be this, this misconception out there that we're gonna deplete our soils. That's just totally not true. 97% of that plant's needs comes out of the atmosphere anyway. Chuck says more of a comment than a question. I'm totally on board with organic matter, modifying essentially every soil property, including soil texture to a point. But you can't turn a soil with 74% sand to one that has only 30%. You can certainly modify how the soil performs, say infiltration, but you can't change it to such a large degree. Maybe to a small extent through aerosol inputs or removals, but not 40%, that would be a major cataclysmic event. But again, soil or organic matter changes everything for the better, but let's not get carried away on the texture change. Okay, um, that, um, that, that slide can maybe be somewhat deceiving, but they're identical soils, the sand, silt, and clay did not change. But as the percentage of organic matter and the percentage of space changes, obviously the percentage of sand, silt, and clay changes. It, so that's what it was in, attempting to illustrate. In a volume basis. Right, yeah, exactly. In a given yeah. volume. Yeah. And I right. think that's what, yeah. what yeah. needs to be stated. Yeah. There. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I agree 100%. You can't change the sand, silt, and clay. That's, that's a given. Yeah. So Danielle asks, so how can we roll this presentation out to every university in ag? <laughs> Fantastic and accessible info. So I think I don't have the answer really, but I think I think it's a, a game that every one of us, it's incumbent upon us to be talking to. You know, if you know a professor at a university, phone them up and say, hey. You know, and it doesn't have to be one of us. It can be any of us that are doing regenerative agriculture. Can, could I come and talk to your class? I, I do lots of work with our local schools here. I just phone the, the science teacher up and say, I'm coming next week to talk about, you know, climate change and soil health and things like that. And they're more than happy to have me come. You know, and I think so every one of us can do that. Talk to your 4-H clubs, your Future Farmers of America clubs, you know, all of these kind of things that each one of us can do this. And so it's just to keep telling the good news story wherever we possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. On that point, Teresa says, absolutely enjoyed this presentation, other than the mention of the word roundup, and appreciate <laughs> the balanced perspective of meat, animals, and plants. Love the science lessons within the presentation. Thank you. Very good, Teresa. Alan asks, as you well know, Blaine, I have a regenerative no-till garden, which in my mind is the best garden around as far as yield and overall appearance is concerned. My concern stems from what you said about keeping it green longer. What is a plant I can sow at this time of the year that will grow little solar panels 
until the snow flies. I guess the first question I would ask is where are you located? If you're located here in Saskatchewan, I would say, uh, you know, you could grow something like uh, a winter wheat or rye or spring cereal oats or spring wheat that will frost terminate depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, again, depending on your context, it could be some of the biennial legumes you could possibly grow if you think nitrogen is going to be a problem in your garden. I think there's lots of possibilities, but I think we need to talk a little bit more about what it is you're, you're trying to accomplish. That's why this context is so important. Yeah, I, I agree with that. One of the things that we use in our garden and I like to see is uh, oats and peas seeded this time of year. They will hang on, you know, if we get the warm weather in the fall, uh, often they grow into early to mid November and do well and create a lot of biomass. Beautiful thing is uh, winter will terminate them and you're ready to just no-till right into them in the spring. But I, I think that's just key. And Blaine, you talked about it, um, about generating wealth and how regenerative agriculture has the opportunity to increase wealth. Well, the only form of really of increasing true wealth is by using solar energy, right. by taking that solar energy out of the atmosphere. And you talked about it, how on most farms, they're collecting that solar energy for only a very short time. And you wanna know how to cycle nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen out of the atmosphere. You have to have green growing plants, you know, and we have to have them for a much longer period of time. Also, you gave the example of the hairy vetch in the corn and adding 180 animal days per acre, $540 mm -hmm. per acre. I mean, most corn farmers would be ecstatic just yeah. to, you know, come anywhere close to that on the, on the <laughs> corn crop. Well, just today I was talking with a group of scientists, as a matter of fact, and they were trying to make the case to me that technology is going to feed the world. It'll be farmers adopting this technology. And I said, first of all, we already produce way more food than humans can consume. Uh, uh, we're already producing in excess. Now there's problems with logistics and spoilage, getting it to the people who need it. That is an issue. But regenerative agriculture will produce way more food per acre. And as you stated, Blaine, it'll be higher in nutrient density. And I think that's what's really missing. You know, agriculture, let's be honest, it is and was part of the problem. Why we're seeing the, this, that alarming statistic you put up of, of uh, 4 million hectares of desert, land that has desertified, agriculture is a part of the problem but regenerative agriculture can be a greater part of the solution. And so we should be touting it. One more comment here from Teresa says, just an observation, there's such a huge chasm between what is being requested, or in other words, coerced from the population versus what is being modeled by those in charge of corporations and governments. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, it's very difficult to change someone's mind when their paycheck depends on status quo. Mm -hmm. and, and you take agriculture worldwide now, especially in the US, Canada, right now there, there are so many corporations, companies, businesses dependent on status quo agriculture it's really going to take the consumers demanding something else to get this changed. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I think is, is important is that the IPCC, who all governments base climate policy, et cetera, on is flawed by its very nature. And it's only looking at anthropogenic emissions. It doesn't look at land use at all. So the science is flawed to begin with. And that's who's making the decisions for most of our governments are based on IPCC recommendations, you know, 
cows fart it's methane that's bad we got to get rid of them that's as far as the thinking goes yeah you know that's uh, right uh blaine allen uh, wrote back blaine i am in northwest saskatchewan i've seen you multiple times i've been battling planting crimson clover and buckwheat just to help my pollinators going into fall and also adding beneficial plants for aiding in nitrogen loss. Uh, so that, that got back to the question as to what to plant, species to plant in the garden. Uh, one species, I, a couple that I strongly recommend uh, throughout the garden is Phacelia. Uh, Phacelia, cool season species, really attracts pollinators and forage. Forage will self-seed in a garden situation and really does a great job attracting pollinators. So a couple species like that. One of the things I do since the question came up about gardening, one of the things that you need to be cognizant of in a garden is gardens as a rule have plenty of forbs, you know, and, and uh, obviously most vegetables and brassicas, but what's lacking in most gardens are that fibrous root system from grasses. So planting an oat, a barley, even some manual rye grass, uh, just don't let it go to seed in your garden. But <laughs> any of those species with a fibrous root system will really help build soil aggregates. What we see even in long-term no-till gardens because they don't have those grasses, we see the soil structure collapsing over time. You really need to add some grasses to the mix in there. Okay, Larry asks a really good question. Was the corn crop hard to harvest with the hairy vetch in it? No, that, when I first saw that field, it was my first experience ever with hairy vetch. This is quite a few years ago. And I thought, oh my God, what did we do? But the corn header went through there just like butter. There was no issues whatsoever. It was just, it just worked so slick. It was unbelievable. It just yeah, seems. I, I've grown that same combination a number of times. And what we see is, uh, you know, vetch is, is really thin vine. Yeah. And with the, uh, with the way the corn heads are set up, it's no issue at all. It doesn't really pull into the corn head. And most of the vetch is going to be below the height of that cob. Yeah. So, uh, Danielle writes, it's difficult for someone to understand something when their paycheck depends on them not understanding it. That's exactly, exactly right. That's about all the questions we have here. If anyone else has any, um, Shane, if you have anything to add, uh, Blaine, any final comments for you? You really gave. No, us I. Uh, I think uh, I just encourage everyone to, to you know, to read, to research, to look some of this up, and uh, you know, let's quit thinking just about that narrow thing called CO two. Let's look at the bigger picture. And understand that water vapor is the number one most dominant species or gas on this planet. And it's influenced by green plants. And we have the power to be able to influence how many green plants we have, depending on whether we're in a dry area or a wet area. But we can determine that. And that is how we will solve the problem is more green plants. It's that simple. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, Blaine. And I, I just want to encourage and tell everyone, you know, your farm, your ranch, your garden, your household is a direct reflection of you and your decisions. So, so oftentimes we get out on a farm or ranch and they say, oh, but you don't understand. My soils aren't like that. Well, do you understand? You can change that. And that was, was one of the most powerful pictures Blaine had in the presentation tonight was the change he saw on his farm from decades of 
conventional farming monocultures and tillage to one now that's focused on regeneration. And we've seen that over and over being able to take those collapsed soils that are not functioning and simply by growing plants and then grazing them with herbivores make a major change. When I, when I graduated, I was taught that to grow one inch of soil took 10, a thousand years, I think it was. You know, that's absolute crap. We know now that we can fix soil within two years. We can see huge improvements. Within five years, you wouldn't recognize it as the same farm by practicing those principles of regeneration. Yeah. And the, the best farms that I see that do it, those farmers get curious. They get out there. And it's the more footprints that farmer puts on that field, the faster regeneration goes because he gets curious. He starts taking a shovel. He starts digging holes. He's smelling stuff. He's looking at plants. He's listening to insects, looking at birds, and he becomes a better observer and he becomes a better steward of that land, a better, better, better manager of land. And those are yeah. the guys that go much, things go much faster on those type of farms. Yeah. You know, it was Masanabu in his book, One Straw Revolution. Right. Yeah. The fertility yeah. of the land is directly related to the footsteps on it's that, on that land. land. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, Blaine, thank you for an excellent presentation. This, this presentation will be posted on our Understanding Ag website. So I encourage everyone to go back and, and take a look at some of the things Blaine presented. We thank everyone for listening in and watch for our upcoming webinars. We're going to be having these webinars uh, much more frequently now, a uh, minimum of at least once a month. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Blaine. Good night. Good night.